episode two, we got some great stuff coming y'all's way. Uh, main focus today is dynamic warm up, how to set up a dynamic warm up, the different pieces of it from a physiological standpoint, how we program it, how we template it, and then we go through specifically the different movements. Um, so a, a ton of great stuff there. We actually have one of our uh, Olympic uh, coaches on the episode with us today, uh, Brian Forrester, who has had 16 All-Americans. He writes his programs for his shot putters. Um, and so he wanted to learn a little bit more about some of the dynamic warm pieces as well. So we go through all that. By the time you're done with the episode, you should know exactly why, how, and what we do here for our dynamic warm-ups. A ton of good stuff in there. Um, I talk about a template as I go through it. If anybody wants access to that template, feel free to email me. I will shoot you that um, so you can kind of see how we exactly set up the movements and how I, I program that to a T. So we get on the whiteboard. Uh, for the first part of the episode, and then we go out and we, we, we physically go through the movements and do some of the coaching cues. So like I said, ton of good stuff. Uh, definitely a lot to enjoy from that. Let me know if you guys have any questions, and if not, enjoy the episode. All right, so here's just kind of how I, I obviously I understand what you're going for, so I'm going to kind of do it like this and kind of spice out our dynamic warm-up, why we put it the way we put it, and then how we kind of sprinkle in our... our uh, prehab stuff and uh at the same time we're going to kind of do a summer evaluation of what we like and didn't like about some of our stuff so you can you know we'll, we'll kind of go through all that um all right so harris what are our four pieces of our dynamic warm-up we have mob faster release that's our first station why because that's we're going to try and loosen up everything we're going to get things releasing uh you know release some tissue before we start to move through that so Usually what we talk about is, um, you know, you want to release it, obviously, and then move through the newfound range of motion yeah. that you have. Go ahead. So I said, like, so if anyone has any restrictions, and then when you release that tissue or that fascia, it's important that you start, you do that first, so that way um, you can move through the newfound range of motion that you have, that you've released, and that you've made through the foam rolling or the softball, um, those techniques that we've used. So why not just do like a static stretch or something? What's the difference between a mild fascia release and like a static stretch? Mild fascia release is going to start getting fluid. It's going to start hydrating the muscle when the, when the fascia gets matted down. Um, a static stretch just shuts the body down. A static stretch doesn't really attack that fascia because the fascia is what surrounds the muscle. And we're trying to attack. So it might not be the muscles that site, it could be the fascia around it. So I mean that's an argumentative point probably, <clears throat> but uh, more or less what we believe is when you do a mild fascia release, the, the tackiness on the muscle and the fascia, we kind of lubricate that 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 tackiness. Um, Sliding muscles yeah, in there. Yeah, and uh, and more or less instead of instead of over lengthening a muscle, which if we just static stretch, you know, like I said, it's argumentative, but over lengthen a muscle, we can we can activate a muscle neurologically. Um, yeah, and also, yeah. Up. As far as me, I, you don't have to worry about me with the static stretching before. I only ever band stretch. Yeah, yeah. Static stretching never occurs until after practice. If they do it, they usually don't watch them do it, but I suggest they do it. Yeah. So, my fast release is the first thing we'll do, and then uh, we just dice it up, really depending on either what we did the day before or what we're going to do that day. So, you know, we had a heavy sprint day. You know, typically their pure performance are going to be fired up. So we'll do a softball release. If we know we're gonna have a big bench day, you know we'll do we'll do a pec release, um, you know IT band release, we'll that, or that vastus lateralis release. So it really just depending on you know if you look on the dynamic warm sheet, we just have muscle groups and different things with PVC pipes. But anyway, mm -hmm. so that's our station one. So ideally, we have to start with that. What's what's next after my fascia release? Mobility. Okay, so we have general mobility next. See if anyone gets this right. What's the first thought process I want to have with general mobility? When I'm diving in, there's a million things I could do with general mobility. Why would I pick what I pick for general mobility? It's an active warm up for what you're about to do that day. A specific warm up. Definitely a piece of it. That and the fact that <clears throat> some of the movements that we do are the some of the movements that we see uh, related to injuries within our sport. Piece of it. Thermogenics. Range of motion. 
number one thing I'm gonna think about general build is what are my athletes' inhibitions. Right. That's what I'm going for. Now, obviously, with different sports, there's different. My, my general ability, if I was training shot putters, would definitely be different than if I'm training mm -hmm. football players. But you know, when we sat down and wrote this offseason general ability, we like, okay, what are our athletes' main issues globally? Globally, you know, T spines aren't great, so we're going to do some T spine mobility in our general mobility. Globally, football players just don't have great hips, so we're going to get hurdles out. We're going to do mobility with hurdles, and generally. When we squat, you know, we notice ankle mobility is an issue with our guys' squats, so we're going to do ankle mobility there. Now, that might be different with your guys' athletes than ours, um, so it just kind of depends on, uh, like I said, what my athletes. So that's, that's the first thing that I'm thinking is what are our athletes' issues, and then that's going to determine what we do for general mobility. Uh, what's, what's our general mobility? Muscle activation. And muscle activation. So, obviously, you know, we sneak in a ton of prehab there. I mean, obviously, it's the, the, the best thing about this stuff is it coincides. You know, you have your general ability, your muscle activation, those, you know, majority of those work both with in, increasing your ability to train right now, and then obviously at the same time preventing injuries um, by, by increasing their mobility in their T-spine, by increasing their ankle mobility. Those things are going to serve a multitude of purposes. So. Um, you're, you're really multitasking. Yes, you're getting ready for that day's workout, but you're, you know, it's a it's an injury prevention uh, all in one. So, all right, muscle activation. What's our what's our two main thought processes there? Recruitment. Yeah. Recruitment pattern. Yeah, that's I, I, I said that's one. So I'd say recruitment pattern for that day's activities right. would be one. What am I doing that day? What muscle groups am I using? If I'm doing a, a lower body lift, I'm not going to sit there and spend 15 minutes. Well, you know, activating your pecs. We just we're not gonna we're not gonna do it. Um, so what what motor patterns are we gonna use that day? So let's activate those motor patterns. Um, and then two, same thing. So that's when we'll sprinkle in what are our issues. So when I first took over here, we had freaking zero glute activation. I mean, it was abysmal. You know, we had we had you know the, that spring before I took over, we had 12, 13 hamstrings, I believe, in that one spring. Um, so that's the first thing that we looked into was how our glutes doing, and they were just freaking shut down. There was no activation, so no activation of glutes means that my hamstrings are going to be overactive. So you know, squatting is going to be tough, sprinting is going to be brutal, um, and then you're going to have a lot of those overuse injuries because your hamstrings are overactive, and it's it's just going to up the kinetic chain, down the kinetic chain, and cause massive amounts of issues. So muscle activation, it's it's you know, I'm thinking, what is our general weakness? What do my athletes not do well? And then I'm gearing that toward that day's activities, whatever we're going to do on that particular day. Obviously, I'm going to focus on uh, activating those muscles. All right, what's the final piece there? You would consider in the muscle activation, obviously, you know, you're going to consider the minor muscles used as your primary activators versus obviously you're using hamstrings and quads. So the glute would be the, the Semi smallest major muscle group in that, so yeah, we're, that's what you're considering the thing you need to activate. Is what you're not going to activate without isolation. You know, what I mean, like if, if, if we just come in here and we do a couple sets of warm up squats, I believe we're going to activate our quads, we're going to activate our hamstrings right. for the most part. But your glutes just aren't going to wake themselves up. Um, and I and I'll, I'll go. So but when we're done here, I just wanted to start on the whiteboard okay. and kind of map this out. We'll go through these specifically, but you know, VMO like that just mm -hmm. it, it doesn't just activate itself. So we spend time doing our TKDs and our different VMO stuff. Um, like I said, which I'll, which I'll go over, but pretty much everything that I've noticed doesn't activate very well on its own when you just pick up a bar and start moving it. That's what we're going to do here with our muscle activation. So, you know, small, small, small muscles of the rotator cuff, VMO, uh, glutes, th those are going to be your, your main ones. Different pieces of your, you know, we'll activate core stuff. Um, and then there'll be other global things, but, you know, for the most part, muscle activation, we're going to spend time on, on those smaller muscle groups or the muscle groups that don't activate very well if you don't isolate them. So that's kind of where we that and like I said that's prehab all on its own. That's mm -hmm. it. you'll you'll your your athletes will, will move better, they'll feel better. It ain't even close. Um and that was number four. Movement prep. Okay, so movement prep. And this is kind of probably the most important piece of it all. So you can have the most myofascially more buttery muscles in the world. You can have great mobility, you can have great activation. If they can't move with it, it doesn't matter. So our movement prep is all patterned to whatever we're gonna do on that particular day. So 
if I'm if we're gonna squat, well, we're gonna do a bilateral movement prep. If we're gonna press, we're gonna do some form of upper back and a, a perfect push up muscle activate or uh, movement prep. If we're gonna be unilateral in the weight room that day, we're gonna do a unilateral movement prep. So you're you know you're firing the neuromuscular system, those biomotor abilities. All we're trying to do is just get the body ready to do those things. So, um, and I'll, I'll, like I said, when we go, we'll go out in the field and we'll kind of uh, piece this together. But so those are our four main pieces. You know, we do a very small portion of this now, um, which I recommend doing something. What is this up here, folks? This very first piece of the warm up. It's, you gotta move, you gotta get the muscles warm. You gotta eat them up. Okay, so thermogenics. Okay, so for us, it's just something different every year. I mean, I, I, the, the, honestly, to me, all I'm thinking is if I can do something relatively sports specific, I'm gonna do it there. But if not, you know, it's, it is what it is. You know, we, so we've done in the past, we did, you know, we did agility ladders. Um, and I hate agility ladders, but we did it just because, you know, the guys like them, we get them ready to work out. So we do that for our piece, and then we go one, two, three, four. Um, this year, you know, we were, we were having more difficulty just coming in focus for a workout. So I don't know if you saw our perfect squats. We did I saw three, that on the top yeah, of the thing. Yeah, so we did, you know, we did perfect squats, which just our guys would all have to line up, and, and you know, they, they have a, a unison order of how they have to do their squats. If something messes up, we do other counts. So, you know, we, we, we use our thermogenics more as a focus piece. So really, I mean, you can break it. This can be jumping jacks, jump rope, agility ladders. Uh, you know. I typically try to use something that makes them more athletic. Yeah, so, so I mean, it's yeah. usually a jelly ladder or jumping rope. Sports specific. That's typically what I do. Yeah, so you know, you, you, you get the you get the, the body temp up, you get that tackiness out. We work on our mobility, you know, our, our immobilization is really where we have our most issues with our with our mobility. We activate the muscles we're going to use for the day, and then we put them into an actual movement, and then you know we're ready to go. And then, like I said, sprinkled in this is all you know all of our prehab stuff. I mean, every piece. But the only thing we really don't get. Um, is our neck, which we do, you know, we do at different which times. Which is an issue for me which mostly. Which you, you don't have to worry about. So um, that's a very general template. And then from here, it's just plug and chug. So like I said, I mean, it, it, as long as you have this template mapped out, that's, I mean, which is what's, what's in front of you for us. Um, and for everybody listening, we, you know, I, I'll, I'm more than happy to send this template to anybody. So just email me and I can uh, send this to you as well. Um, but so then you just plug and chug, and then we progress as well. So um, why don't we why don't we go on the field? Let's get uh, let's get a hurdle set up. Let's get all of our VMO variation band stuff set up. So we just need gray bands, orange bands, um, one box. Let's get uh, our our different glute band variations, and then uh, we'll meet out there. Cool. Cool. Come on. All right, so uh, I'll just start them up body-wise. Like I said, a lot of this stuff is either after a heavy press day um, or before, and just the immediate, immediate release. You know what I mean? A lot of this stuff is a version of ART, active release therapy. Um, we'll do some team spine stuff with this as well. Uh, but as much as my fast release it is, it's, it's, it's a trigger point release too. So um, let's just start generic here, upper body-wise. So we'll, we'll go up into lat is one of the most underutilized myofascial release pieces. So we're here, we'll put the back of the hand on the ground. I start them all at the bottom of the lat and we'll roll all the way up into the armpit. And so the big thing here, you roll fast, so just roll roll over top and down those knots. You gotta roll slow when you find one. I always prefer moving. So instead of keeping rolling, if they find a knot, I'm gonna coach them to shop their arm around and let that muscle sink over top of that PVC pipe. And it just breaks it up a lot better from what, from what we've seen. So we'll work them into the lat. What are you talking about a big bench day or just a big throw day for you guys? I mean, you, you, how much better they'll feel just from doing this stuff is incredible. Uh, another piece that we'll usually just roll right into from here is triceps. People never roll up their freaking triceps. You have no idea that your triceps can knot up until you put them on a PVC pipe and try to roll them out. So here, same thing. We'll roll slow, and then as soon as they find a the spot, I want to move. I don't want to just keep on rolling. So if he finds a knot right here, I want him to flex and extend through that PVC pipe. And like I said, the difference that'll make on a big bench day for us is out of this world. Hey, um, you know, we have a different, different variations of things, but you know, we have our man-made peanuts, we have softballs. I like the crossballs most for this. 
we don't have one out right now, so we'll just use this. Um, but one of the biggest places our guys get knotted up is in that scapular area. So kind of that diagonal, pretty much you get this, kind of diagonal area down on this scap. We'll fold this, this arm over so we can expose those. And he'll just lay down on top of this. And then he'll just work it all the way down until he gets to here, but same thing. So he's working it down. If he finds a knot right there, he'll stop, he'll shop. Then he'll roll a little more. He finds a knot, he'll stop, he'll shop. So we'll start on the top, almost up in the trap. Fold the arm over, and now he's shopping. Once he finds a spot, he's just moving around. So great upper body shoulder release. And then he'll work all the way down it. I move pretty quick these, but just you work all the way down a diagonal, obviously you work both. Um, for a pec release, probably one thing I see a, a ton of people do that I just, I don't believe it ever helps anything. They'll stick, they'll stick a softball or a cross ball and they'll stick it right on the tendon insertions. Well, when your pec is flared up, it's, you already have mass amounts of inflammation in there and that thing is already not, not feeling great. So why would I put more trauma on it? Um, instead, I like to release the meat of the muscle. So with this one, he'll put his hand behind his back and I tell my guys, stay out of these insertion points and stay in the meat of the pec. If I can relax the meat of the pec, the tendons are gonna relax as well. So we wanna stay right in the meat of the pec, so coach will grab that, he'll roll over on top of it. And this one, we won't really shop around. If anything, we'll kind of push and breathe into it and just kind of sink into the pec. The same thing, the release you'll get from that is uh, incredible, which is really good. Um, so for the back stuff, uh, going back to QVC pipe. So when we go when we go T spine, we really want to focus on one thing. I, I think is an issue is people will start they'll start with a PVC pipe all the way down right on top of their pelvis. If you think about a joint by joint approach, you have joints that are meant to stabilize, and you have joints that are meant to mobilize. We know the T spine it's meant to mobilize, right? It's meant to bend. That's the whole point of having the T spine. Your lumbar spine are meant to be stability joints. Yeah, that, that shit ain't supposed to move. So we get a PVC pipe, we put it on a, on a lumbar spine and we try to mobilize a stabilization joint. How the fuck does that make any sense to anybody? So that's one thing that if I'll catch my athletes just doing it because they think it's right and they think it feels good. Um, but so that's, that's the biggest thing. So same thing, I want to be active here, but we're not going past the mid back, okay? So we're going to go, you know, T-spine up, up to the bottom of the neck and that's where we're going to roll. And then I'll just have them mobilize their arms. So I don't care if they hug, if they reach, if they alternate, but I'm like I said, I'm just trying to get the erectors moving, get some variation of it opening up, and just getting them moving. So like I said, try to stay on the T-spine, stay out of the low back. You don't want to mobilize the stability joint. We get on all those ones so far? Um, all right, so we'll go low body. Probably my favorite one. Um, so I, I still sometimes call this an IT release, which we know is absolutely impossible, but the player don't know what IT is, so sometimes it's so sad. Um, but the, the IT band can't be lengthened. We, we, we know that. They've, they've done a million studies on it now. Probably not a million. I might over exaggerate a little bit, but they've done studies on it. We know the IT bands can't lengthen, but the fascial sheath on the uh, vastus lateralis, we can, we can supple that. We can get that buttery, and we can move that. So what we do here is you can do this PVC pipe or a softball, and this one freaking sucks. You gotta try this one. So, Harris is gonna roll over and he's almost gonna smash that vastus lateralis and roll forward on it. You don't wanna stay, get on the actual IT band, but kind of right on that gap before it. Same thing, I want movement. So you're gonna roll your hips down and when he finds a spot, he's just gonna flex and extend. And the amount of the, the release you get from this is crazy. I mean, anytime we're gonna sprint fast, we have a big plyo day or a big squat day, our guys get, I mean, it sucks, but our guys get massive release uh, from this and they love it. So, I mean, obviously, you know, you have your, everyone knows your quad release. Same thing, I mean, my, my philosophy doesn't change. If you find a spot, I want to flex, extend. Uh, if he goes over on his hamstring, I want to flex and relax. So if I'm here, he'll roll. If he finds a spot, try to flex the quad into it or stack the feet so we can put more weight down onto it. We'll use PVC by for a softball for this. And then probably our main go, go to from there is just pure performance. So for right piriformis, we want to cross right foot over on top of left knee 
and you want to sink into it. So as soon as he finds a spot, just trying to relax that and letting that ball smash in there and sink into it, he's going to get the most release from. Um, is there anything I'm missing? Any of our big, our big hitters here? So as. So as. Oh, so so as I like. We don't have any. So so as what I like the most of. So I kind of call it an inverted U. So you lay on your back, lay on your back. So more or less, we'll just we'll, we'll work breaths into it. So I like to use those. I mean, you can use a freaking soccer ball or those little inflatable balls. These work, but so they'll stick. They'll they'll be on their on their bellies. So I'll just take the ball right here, and I'll just have them when they're, when they're down on the hips. There you go. Okay. So these are freaking great, and it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't seem like you talk about low back pain. Everything. This is my freaking go-to right here. So you, they'll put this on. They'll roll over, and I just have them push either their hip or their belly into it. So we don't. We, well, we always work on belly breathing, so pushing their belly out. So just an inverted U. So pretty much they're up, and they'll take about five breaths at each spot. Work it here, 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 and then back down this hip flexor. So we're just releasing the hold. Like I said, I mean, the, the hold is all I mean. That's weird because I've been doing, so, so I've been laying on the ball and right definitely high, way higher than, like, I just find that spot and I just lay on it and breathe it out, like, push yeah, it out. There, no, you're, like, you're good. I mean, there, there's no, there's a big difference in the, there's the, no right answer for, for okay. I mean, it's, for you, especially for smashing, it's, it's, it's where you, where you feel it. Okay. Well, I didn't know to do it lower than that. Yeah, I, mean, I was that's, told to do it somewhere up about one or two inches off your belly button somewhere. Yeah, that, and that's, that's going to release a little bit more low back stuff, but for your actual psoas and surgery, because that's where our guys get the most flared up, I want them, I want them kind of in that inverted U, but yeah, I mean, you're, okay. it's pretty high. I mean, it's, it's, I guess we're probably usually coaching right, right below the belly button, but if you get released from freaking put it here, I mean, it's great. Well, I, didn't, I didn't know to do it anywhere else. Yeah, that's no, the only so, place I've been doing it. Yeah, you put it down here, I mean, you get it, there's a ton of, ton of release. So anyways, let's just show them that. So he'll take that, he'll roll over on his belly, and he's just trying to fill his belly up with air, which sounds like he's been doing. Yeah, just push out, like yep. heavy breathing. And then we'll have hold at the top for a one count, and then just freaking let it sink all the way back down. And just let that sink in. So yeah, I mean. He felt that So as, so as is, is, well first off, the hips are freaking tough to begin with, just because it's like a freaking massive railroad station. First so right now, I'm having, I'm, I'm having left hip problems. So that's why. I'm, yeah, um, but the psoas, I mean, the psoas is the only muscle that doesn't have a posterior anterior. It's just, it connects from the back to the front. So how many issues that can have with pelvic tilts, it's, it can be a big dilemma. Um, so for the most part, that's our myofascial release. Uh, any questions with that, that piece of it? Anybody? No? We good there? Um, Harris, you want to go go through general mobility? Take me through it. Kind of the general principles of it so far. I'm just kind of talk about okay, take some of our, our curl stuff. Let me go, you want to do ankle? Do you do ankle, yeah. All right. Um, so when we go into our general mobility, like we talked about in the first session here, um, we're basically taking the spots that we know our guys struggle with. Uh, we see a lot of guys squat, and it's not so much their hips, but it's their ankles that we see. You know, they struggle, they can't dorsiflex, they can't get the full dorsiflexion at the bottom of a the squat, they start getting up on their toes. Um, and the first thing you'll look at is their hips, and then you start looking down the chain and you go, oh, it's the ankle. You know, that's, that's where the problem is. So that's one of the first things we attack here in our general mobility station. Uh, we have a couple different progressions. Um, the first one that we added in this year that we really liked was a banded ankle. So we do this with partners. Um, so I'm gonna, Coach Lee, my partner here, He's going to put this band right here at the transverse joint. You can see that. So we, we just cue it right over the tongue of your shoe. Um, that's just a great cue for our guys. Keeps it simple. Kind of gives them a great cue. He's going to take that left foot, put it out in front of him a little bit, get some tension on this band. Good. And I'm going to kind of, I'm going to pull it down in this downward direction. So I'm going to kind of tack it down with my hand towards the floor. And we go five reps over our pinky toe, five reps over the middle toe, and then five reps over the big toe. He's going to try and keep that heel on the ground. Um, and something we see if your guys get lazier, you know, tell them to put their hands on their knee and start driving that knee over their toes. So allow them to get more dorsiflexion each way. We tell them to get as much range of motion as you can each rep. Just each rep, get more and more as you can. And then we'll go standing. We'll progress into standing here. 
he's going to do the same exact thing. He's going to push as far as he can without that heel coming off the ground. You're doing this all before you would do basic dips on the compression. Oh, yeah, I mean, this this is pretty much the place it, from that standpoint. And all the, the hard stuff, that's all of our region stuff now. So that's, that's we get done lifting, we utilize that for our region stuff. So we'll get them in and we'll, we'll serve well with bands and that's when we're going through the, the normal progression. And it probably started because we just didn't have enough bands to do with everybody. And like I said, at the end of the day, to me, movement is king. So I want to get you guys moving. We can move a little bit more with this instead of just pulling on bands. We're working the same mobility patterns, except for the guys are actually moving, you know? So that helps that. And obviously our sport is massively moving and prep. So, um, but the results we've seen just from this stuff is adding in this stuff has been exponential. Um, and then just a couple progressions more for that ankle mobility, a couple other things are pretty great, is if they get through that and they got good ankle mobility, you can elevate them, just put them up on a box. Back knee takes a knee, and this just increases the angle. And now, same thing, I'm pushing that knee forward, and this freaking lights that angle up right here. And you can hook them up to a, a rack. Same thing, a partner can hold it, but that's freaking, that lights you up. Um, and then we'll do manual stuff too, sometimes with that. Uh, you should just get real guard basic girl stuff. Real lateral lunate. Um, so we talked about earlier, Monday, Friday, are our bilateral lower body days. Um, so we'll use the hurdles here, and basically we're just trying to keep the, we're just trying to get those hips moving in the capsule. So without twisting, because if you're twisting, you're no longer moving in that range of motion right within the capsule. Because you can't look at the camera, you can just talk to the people. <laughs> <laughs> First time on camera, I'm sorry. I'm talking to the viewers, man. The curriculum! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so we, have, we just kind of, we tell our guys, lock your hands in behind your head. All right, we're gonna go uh, linear overs here. We lock them in, we tell them to brace, pull them ribs down, stay neutral, and then just out, and over. And we're gonna go back. Feel it, feel it, keep an unbroke chain, it's like, you know, I have like day one issues, so if their elbows break forward, and the other back's gonna break, the hips are gonna break, the knees are gonna break, and the neck is gonna break. And if they, can, if they can't, if they can't contract their hip flexor without all that other shit breaking, kind of just, you know, it's like fake mobility. And we'll go, we'll go with our linear under here. So we're gonna go down, we'll get them squat, down, big reach, and then we pull through. Yeah, we'll go like five reps each way. Squat down. So, I mean, obviously, you know, hurdles are hurdles. I mean, everyone kind of gets an idea of what to do with hurdles. I'd say the biggest thing is just, like I said, make sure they're not breaking up the kinetic chain because it's just, it's a terror. I mean, if, if they learn, if their natural pattern is to learn to contract the hip and break the upper back, it's just, it's leading to a whole host of problems. So, whatever you do through the hurdles, whether it's can cans, whether it's linear overs, unders, just keep everything in a straight line. That's the biggest focus you have. Um, so T-spine stuff, and this is massive from what we talked about here, mentioned stuff, you'll see a huge difference with this. So we'll do, you know, our, our, I'll just show, I'll go through some of our main ones. Um, so T-spine sit-ups, we call them, okay? All we're gonna do, we'll turn around so they can see it. All we're gonna do is start the same thing, right? The T-spine, so a little bit lower than mid-back, we're gonna start there, and we're just gonna crunch on the ball and just work our way all the way up to the scaps. And he'll do about three crunches at each spot and keep on working it up. So he's down here, he's down. Yeah, he starts with the ball, hands are behind his head. When we when we lay on the ball, I want to try to be flush with the floor. So arms, elbows, and then it comes with a crunch that I want to tight. Elbows are tight. Crunch, 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 and back down. So he'll do about three there, and then he'll scoot down, working the ball up a little bit. Working with one vertebrae at a time. Yep. Yep. Then obviously we'll take our time with this. Okay, but that's that's one of our T spines. Um, our press will stretch. So we'll go right leg over, grabbing the back heel, and we work our breathing patterns with this too. So eyes stay on the back here, 
He'll take a deep breath in, and then he'll try to push everything down. He will. He will. And that is usually where we get active with him. So, like, right now, if he can't push that knee on the ground, I'm going to come over and grab him. I'm going to help him get there. So we're going to mobilize that. Um, we just don't usually have time to partner him up, but I would love to partner him because really all these are better. Let's go quadruped position. So this is our quadruped T-spine. He'll go hand behind the back here. Okay. And I'll just come over here, and I'll scoop underneath his shoulder. He'll try to work his shoulder down, and then he'll come up, eyes on the back elbow. And I'm pushing in the T-spine flexion here. I'm just opening his chest up, and he's got to make sure he keeps his eye on his back elbow. Okay, and then we'll send him into child's pose. Mix it up a little bit. He'll put his hand on his back again. Same thing. So now I'm grabbing under the shoulder. Breathe out. Breathe out. Open up. Breathe in. Breathe out. Open up. Okay, so I, I, I like to push him into that more. They get a lot more out when we do it than when they do it. So that our general mobility session, those are your three main things. We're working hip mobility, we're working ankle mobility, we're working T spine mobility. What do you what what do you what is your biggest issue with mobility with your guys and girls? Well, I don't have that big a group, so it's not really global as much as individual. You know, with, with less than fifteen people usually per year, it's this person has this, this person has this, you know, so I Normally, I would. A long time ago, I thought it'd be great if I could, you know, break the crap out of all of them. And then I was like, that's a bad idea. Uh, I'll spend all my time. Uh, I don't know. Personally, I'm looking at the camera just in case anybody <laughs> needs to, uh, to see me talk. Personally, I think people can get too caught up Absolutely. in doing stabilization training and trying to fix all these things and they're still weak at the end of the day you still gotta be strong so you gotta have enough strength and enough mobility and enough you know you have to have enough stuff you can keep getting strong without getting hurt mm -hmm. but you can't do all your time doing balance training and say that you can't squat until you can do a you know balance on a post ball standing or something silly like that Absolutely. so I'd say that I still think that strength and power is the most important thing and I try to do enough of the other stuff to make sure that we can continually keep moving forward without being injured because injuries are the biggest thing that keeps people from moving forward which is why I'm sitting here at this thing is I'm trying to figure out how I can train my kids as hard as possible but still move forward yeah um, by adding in and I like what you said the other day was Stuff in the middle has to change. This is the A and the C that's the difference. And that's what I want to upgrade my A and the C. Yeah. No, I mean, I couldn't agree more. That's so many people are so caught up that, I mean, well, America, strain in general, like we are so obsessed with fads that if something comes in, like we're just absorbed by it. Um, I think it's taking the pieces of each one. And obviously, mobility is damn near a fad right now. I think it's taking pieces of it because it's, we've seen huge huge differences in doing this stuff from an injury standpoint. I mean, our injuries have gone down tremendously since 2012 when we started doing this stuff, 2013. Um, and our, our results in the weight room have gone through the roof. So it's, it obviously plays a huge piece of it. But yeah, if you if you have a 90 minute workout and you spend the first 60 minutes training mobility, I don't give a shit how mobile you are. If you have zero strength and zero power, how far are you gonna throw a freaking shot put? Yeah. You ain't gonna you're, throw not, you're ever gonna see the field to get injured. No. It ain't gonna matter. So you're definitely right. That's a, it's definitely about having a, a really good balance. Um, any questions on general mobility? You good there? All right. Probably honestly, where the most prevention stuff that you're probably looking for, Forrester, uh, is in our muscle activation station. So uh, number one, I mean, just for us, just because of how much of a difference I saw. Well, it's probably I don't know, it's close glutes and, and VMOs. So uh, the VMO that's me now is oblique. Uh, it's that teardrop muscle. It right to the left or right the medial side of your kneecap, but it's responsible for making your knee, your patella track straight up and straight down. Um, so anybody you guys, you know, you know how many athletes have patellar tendonitis? Uh, we had a ton of them. I mean, our dudes couldn't freaking squat when I first got here without, I mean, everybody had freaking some sort of knee issue. So 
first thing I did is I just put in a ton of different TK VMO activation type stuff. Track, right? Yeah. And so just how immediate the knee pain went away when you started doing this stuff, it was incredible. So we kind of have a progression, which I mean, I don't know, maybe we're overthinking it, but it works well for us. Um, so our first basic progression is just a partner VMO stretch. Um, parachute from here real quick. So pretty self-explanatory. We're just gonna put the band right behind the knee. He's gonna go the opposite knee. Okay, and all we're gonna do is keep this band leg right underneath the hip. We're gonna work up on the toe and then lock the knee. Up on the toe, lock the knee. And when you gotta cue the right part of the quad, so we're walking around, we're poking them in their VMOs and making sure they're activating the right piece of the muscle. So we're just here first. This is how we'll start. We'll start with an orange band or we'll work to a, to a gray band. But this is kind of how we'll, we'll start. So everyone's just doing this. And that was kind of our first basic form. And then we work into some more of the TKE stuff. So I'm not sure what TKE is. Terminal knee extension. Okay. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm like notorious for I despise names and stuff. Because I, I like need anatomical terms. Or else when I look back at my programs, I can't remember what the hell it is. Um, or like I hate when I'm trying to read something and they call something by a name and I'm just like, wish I could figure out what that was. Um, I was talking to you, was talking to me by Judd, who got the call to my new Yeah. Yeah. And did for some guy. Yeah. The, the first, the first progression is the ice Yeah. Well, that's a piece of it. I'm just trying to speak, speak to this a little bit. Um, and you can, yeah, you can do with ISO holes and we believe will be center expansion. So you can, you can vary it how, how you want to. I mean, you can same thing, you can just do a hold. You can do a hold into a slow release. You can do a concentric. I'm not gonna get into that detail right now. Um, so we'll do we'll work a few different things on that. From there, then we'll work onto a box. And obviously we can work this with bands, we can work this with height, and we can work this with distance of the foot forward. So the first week we implement this, it's just keep the heel down, work the knee forward, tap the heel on the ground and come back up. And then we'll start pushing their feet up forward so we'll try to start working their heels up in front of the box and try to get as far that way as we can. Wanna work it through? Yeah, yeah. When I watch Paul when he turns the foot out about 15 degrees. Yeah. And you actually, he says, to allow the knee to travel over the ball of the foot yeah. and actually allow your heel to come off the ground. You, yeah, I mean, you, you're, like, we're, we usually don't ever freaking, you know, we're like anti-knee, but here, we'll, we'll, we'll teach them to do it. I just, I mean, I, I mean, everyone has their own. I just don't like getting there. I just don't like getting them back anterior. Um, I, I, I know I've, I've read the pilot plan. It's just, it's, it's, it's more activation. Yeah, it, it, it makes it work harder. Yeah, yeah. I just, I just, I don't, I just, I, when, when I've done it in the past, I've just gotten guys like crap, like, yeah, like, that hurts. Um, and so that's when I, mean, I, when I first started doing it, that's how we did it, is we, 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 we pull them all the way up into here, and then we just have guys, and I was like, look, I mean, all right, keep your heel on the ground, push your knee as far forward, tell me how that feels. Oh, that feels great, I feel soft. I just, I just switched it, but yeah, I mean, that's what, if, if you read all his stuff, he studied, there was more information when the heel came off the ground. Um, it's just, I don't understand what it is. So it's, that's, it may not be a good reason, but this just, this, we got better results out of, reason, actually. Out of this, so. Um, so we keep their heel down, but we do we, when we coach them to push their knee as far forward as they can go, um, and then back up. So we'll stimulate this, and then once they're good there, we'll put a band behind their knee, and now we're pushing up, and they'll have the band, and they're locking the knee out. So the band, we do it. What two boxes? Me and Harris will be going, um, or if you just got a one athlete, just hook it up to the rack, hook it up to the rack, go to work, um, and then obviously you can increase the height of the box, the band tension how far you let that foot go forward, how far you let the knee go forward. Um, and if you choose to let the heel come off the ground, that's obviously a more, more intense version of it. Um, anything with the BMOs I'm missing there? Good? No, you're good. All right, now for any glutes, we have a thousand different things. So um, these bands become our best friends. Get these off Elite FTS, there's different thickness of them, we have our the basic red ones and we've, we've worked up to the end of these like green ones. We didn't use these for the first year we did it, we just stayed with these. Um, so we'll do a ton of different variations. Uh, what 
we've what we've seen with the, 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 the latest research I've read is the most boot activation happens when the bands are on the midfoot. You want to put this on Harris? So we'll go midfoot for our monster walks, and we'll vary these a ton. Um, but the biggest thing is we want to we don't want to we want to start them outside the hip frame. We want them to work to push their knees out, and we say don't let your knees ever come inside your ankles. So before he does anything, he's going to push his knees out. That's his that's his base stance. So that doesn't change. Yeah, so now, now he's just quarter squat. Now he's just taking two inches to watch his feet. Those things gotta be square. As soon as he opens that up, he's deactivating the glutes. So we're kind of straight, we're, we're trying to create that torque. And he's just taking two, two inch steps. His back foot, guys would drag that all the time. So you gotta coach the shit out of that so they're actually picking it up, putting it down. Or they'll let his back foot slam in and they'll release all their tension. So it's just two inch steps. Two inch steps, you can't uh, mess that up too much. Okay, so then we'll work a different Two different things, so we'll go singles, which is a great one. I love doing this on squat day. Um, yeah, mid, 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 mid. So they'll get in that same position as their base stance. Now all he's doing is there's no singles. So he's down the right, he's down the left, and all he's doing is firing that knee out. So just creating that torque, creating that small foot, and just pushing that knee out. Like I said, we always want our toes straight forward here, which doesn't mean we squat like that. I think you should prep like this, and then you should squat how your hip structure tells you to squat. I was, I was tempted to put a band around their knees and do squat warm-ups that way, like, you know, with a bar. Yeah, yeah. Knees yeah. out, butt out. You know, like, I that, tempted what, to do it like that as my, you know, dude, our, our bridge first. between doing this for five minutes or just, hey, on your warm-up sets today, we're going to use a band around your knees. Our first three weeks of our winter program, everybody squats with a band around their knees. Because everyone gets done with the season and you know they come back and they're they're, they're kind of quivering, they're a little they have a little valgus, so we just freaking put a, a light band over the knees and you'll just you just see them start doing this on their knees. It's it's like an immediate fix. Um, so it's a great idea, especially in your light sets. I would do something to isolate it before you squat. And you don't have to I don't think you have to do it a ton, but and I'll show you we do a glute check. Even if, as, long, as long as you just have them do a glute check, we'll make sure their glutes are firing before they run, jump squat, whatever the hell it is, you'll, they'll feel 10 times better and the performance will be through the roof. Um, so that's mid-knee. Um, check those off now. So our glute check, so what we'll do before we ever sprint or perform, we'll lay them down on their bellies. They keep their legs long and all I tell them to do is just pull this leg off the ground three times. Okay? And if you, anybody out there with chronic hamstring issues, lay on the ground right now and do this, okay? If you feel this pull from your hamstring, no shit, that's why your hamstrings are already always pulled, all right? This should come from your glute. So when coach lifts, he should feel that glute the first thing that activates. So that's how I know his glutes are fired up, ready to squat, jump, run, whatever it is. I know that if my athletes say, hey coach, my right hamstring, that's where I feel, I don't even feel it in my glute. I know that glute's underactive. I know that hamstring's overactive and there's a good chance he's gonna get some form of injury on that day. So we work that with both legs. Um, so let's say that, uh, let's say he's feeling his hamstring, what, but you still want to train, what's your bridge to get the glute ready yep. to come in here? So I, I'll either do some more of the band stuff or I'll get him in a manual position. So like if his hamstring's not rolling, usually clamshells will take that right, right away. So I'll just put here, I'll get him up, I'll resist him up, 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 up. And I'm using cues, I'm pushing on that glute to try to get him fired up. He's pushing up. That's one option. I'll take him through the band stuff, um, get him in a quadruped position, and I'll kind of check in between each, just have him do a scorpion up, and I'm freaking punching his glute, making sure he knows where to pull from and trying to wake him up. I don't do that with your girl athletes. Uh, I treat them pretty much the same. Actually. Yeah, as, as you should. <laughs> um, so if I was going to punch my guy there, I'd probably punch my girl there. Yeah. I may not rest my hand on it, but. Right, right. Punch it'd, be a, it'd be a quick reaction yeah. time. Uh, so what we'll do, I mean, like, so when you see like our speed warm ups, we'll go through our speed stuff, we'll do some glute activation, and then anybody who does their glute check and they don't feel it from their glutes, they feel it from their hamstrings, they raise their hands. We'll have three or four guys every day. They'll run over to him and he'll do three, four minutes of glute stuff, and then they'll work to their corner. The best one, like you said, if the clean feels are by far, like, so I would go through a bunch of different things, and then that would be like my last resort, just to kind of find out what. So the only other piece of the muscle I can or the, yeah, the activation stage, we have all our upper back stuff. 
which I, I won't specifically go through, but I mean, that's all our scat pull parts, our black burns, um, scat push-ups, any of our upper back movements, we'll, we'll hit at least two before we can. We'll, we'll never press without doing some form of upper back mobilization, um, activation. Do that? Yeah. I, I think I know, like, I don't know what a black burn is, but I got his name back oh, Chase. Yeah. 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 All right, so Coach Lane and Melanie. So we literally start these body weight because they're freaking brutal. Um, six seconds up, six seconds down, so it's time under tension. Start by, uh, by your butt, Coach. Okay, so palms are facing up first. Our coaching cue is when you get back to this position, you don't you want your hands off your butt, which that alone is brutal to hold that position. Yep, so he's out. When he gets to about shoulder width, he's going to flip the hands. So he's six, five, four, three, two, one, he's reaching, 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 then he's back the other way. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so we'll typically do five reps of that, and then our progression is just wait. And what, what did you call that? Uh, black burn. That's the black burn. That's a black burn. Okay. That's me being a hypocrite and using a name. I was just going to say, yeah. you just told me you I use, But they're, they're very minimalized in my programming. I barely use them. We very rarely use them. Um, <laughs> but then these are freaking great. So we'll, this is one of our main upper back things. Um, and what is progressive weight? But I'm telling you, if you can do that, if you can do 10 reps of that with a five pound plate in your hand, you got a freaking strong ass upper back. Because um, that's brutal. So we'll do that. Um, our scat pull aparts, we got tiny variations here. So the biggest thing that I can tell you with scat pull aparts, I see in, in our players immediately want to do it, is when they're out in their position, they'll raise their traps and they're tight here. So our biggest coaching cue is take your scaps and try to put them in your back pocket so they're rolling them back and down. That's our set position. If you don't start there, you're, you're screwed. There's no point in doing them. So best coach you I can tell you to use is put your scaps in your back pocket and that makes them envision kind of setting them back and down. So we'll go back and down and then we're trying to keep constant tension on the band. So I want coach to pull out about half an inch. So now there's tension here. He's already got tension here back, right coach? Now he's gonna go all the way back he's going to return to that position, but I don't want him relaxing up top. So always, always tension. Always tension. Whenever we're doing upper back, we want constant tension. We don't want to reset those scaps. So Typically I've done those three, three plane, or well, not three planes, but uh, straight across and then X, X. There you go. Yep. Up. So that's what I was thinking about that. Just yeah, I mean, that's huge. If you, the, the, the upper back's not really even working if I'm here. So you got to roll it back and down. So those you just named our next two, and then we have reverse. So reverse, you only need one piece of the band for this because it's freaking brutal. Okay, we want to start, elbows tight. Coach is going to roll his scats back and down. He's going to squeeze his elbows in like he's trying to keep two credit cards locked in there. He's got his tension to start, and then he's just rotating back as far as he can until his elbows come out. So we want to try to keep those triceps glued and tight on those lats. And he's pushing out and saying, this will freaking absolutely light up your upper back. Um, so we have a whole upper back progression that we, we super set up with our bench, but those are our main activation exercises that we'll do in the actual warm up. And we usually just do one of them. So they'll come out, we'll do 10, we'll do five, 10 black burn, we'll do scat pull apart, some variation. But that's in our warm up before we come in here to do anything. And they'll super set upper back stuff with their bench press as well. Um, but that's just massive. Just even for creating a boner pattern of them. Because when they're bench pressing, I can't tell you how many of our guys come in here and bench up here. And you know, they come down, boom, their elbows lay in there scat swing out and just being able to coach that cue but before that bar ever moves they should back it down break that bar and go to work so we we coach that with the hand, which that translates over to the bench press i mean that, that first summer we started doing all this upper back stuff and teaching them all that i think our average bench went up like 55 pounds it was stupid just because we, we, we were dumbasses and not to teach the coach the bench you know you still think it's a bench press why coach it well just for shoulder health you get them to lock in and train your shoulder health, it's, it's immense how much that makes a difference. So um, that's our main, that's our main of the guy. Uh, Any I'm missing there? Yeah, bat wings are great. That's just one piece of it. Um, and there's a thousand different perfect things you can do. Like I said, it's, it's, it's create your template and then plug each other.
direction yeah. and or yeah. not like I said you just want I think five we we're on the end of we want to have progressions but how much how much do you overthink it sometimes is where we try to simplify and so for you I mean yours is more monotony than anything like they're gonna train so long now before their next competition like maybe you block not just in progression but I mean who's to say a a, a blackbird is better than a bat wing but maybe you do blackbirds for four weeks and then bat wings for four weeks and scat pole bars for four weeks. Yes. Just that's typically how I do not. that's typically how I do my auxiliaries. So when I when I'm writing lifting programs, my my squat changes every usually three weeks. So yeah. it'll be a back squat either straight with chains, with bands, whatever, and then there's always a safety squat and then then the third week is usually a box. And then I go back through that. But with auxiliaries I typically go three weeks of the same auxiliary in a pyramid fashion, from high reps to low reps, and then three weeks later, or I'm sorry, then on the, the next yeah. whatever, the next three yeah. weeks in a different yeah. auxiliary. Yeah. Now ideally, yeah. one of the things I want to talk about maybe when we get to it today is having a more logical progression from uh, auxiliary to auxiliary to auxiliary if you're thinking about the 12 weeks of what is what's the best order to build your best bench at the end. Right now I kind of like, well, this time we'll do this, next time we'll do this, next time we'll do that. There's not a lot of logical thought process on which one builds into another one, other than maybe multi joints better than single joint later, uh, you know, something like that. But so I that's kind of how I was like, what are your, it comes down a lot to these, like, what, what's your limiting factor? What, what, what is that at? And maybe you don't have all the athletes on the same basis. Some of our, I mean, if, if your athletes get buried here on the bench, they don't have freaking triceps, so they need to weigh in dips. If your guys get buried at the bottom, then it's a whole other issue. Maybe it's an upper back, maybe it is their lats. So maybe your your auxiliaries kind of change and weep. And that's why we have our high beat stuff. Um, yeah. Which is something that it's going to be hard for me to, because we're only in here two days a week, you know, and I have so much to to do. It's going to be hard to, you have to figure out what's most important. Yeah. The longer you're doing it, I've been, been writing strength program. stuff too. I would just say for, for sake of this being one episode we can be talking about this. Um, let's get into some questions. Uh, what what specific what I mean you want to you want to fire through some some five to do bilateral upper body and, and unilateral movement prep real quick. Our last station. Let's go through a squat progression, a unilateral progression and then we'll have just some more upper body activator movement prep is used to use a vertical press horizontal press. Yeah. So basically with our, when we do our movement prep, exactly what it sounds like, it's almost like what you're talking about when you're doing your work. Did you hear that? Uh, our progression, uh, all through the intersection, isometric, when you're going through your actual range of motion. So that may be something you want to think about when you're doing our stuff, but actually, you don't want to get that talking about this one. And when we go through, so like if our day one, if you're looking at the sheet, our day one uh, movement prep is going to be like teaching our good warnings. So we're just teaching uh, teaching that, that hinge and uh, actually getting uh, their uh, hamstrings fired up. And then we're doing it on the field. With a PVC pipe. With a PVC pipe or a plate. So we'll go through our plate good morning. And we'll call it a two-way good morning because we'll go through a narrow stance and then a medial stance. And we're just teaching a lot of stuff that we teach us with the core, uh, with the uh, incorporate core. So we want to push the plate against our chest, get into a nice narrow stance, get our hip width. We're going to really talk about rotating and pushing that hip back to get a nice stretch. All right, so then we're going to go after that. We'll go into our medial uh, hamstring and we'll do the same thing. So we want to go into more sumo pins. I always tell the guys, hey, uh, feet outside your shoulders, point your toes to the wall, 
Field talk about getting good posture, brace and breathe, shoulder blades back and down, head in a neutral stance, you're rotating that hip, and you're pushing back as much as you can to get through that stretch also. So we'll go into doing that. And that'll take that'll take us into our squat. So when we teach our squat, we'll also have to still use our hamstrings. And then we'll go into our uh, our squat, get into a nice side down squat position, which I can consider to be important. Try to push the knees out. One thing I tell them to do is go ahead and start pulling up on the floor, right? Straighten out that back, and we're going to a lock. So after that, then we'll go into our squat progression. If you look at the sheet, our squat progression. East center first, so. So like, so yeah, our squat progression is, is that from Monday to Friday, is that with our squats and our lunges and our lateral lunges. So we go through the same progression. So, like the first two weeks, we'll go through, we'll talk about locking in to engage those lats to keep the core, uh, to keep the core nice and tight, keep the chest up, sort of lay back and down. So locking in those, pull it apart, and put the lats tight up. So that's also helping uh, the shoulder problems that you're talking about that you want to go through within the program. And from then, uh, we go through a six second eccentric. We go through about 30 seconds per uh, per rep or per set. And I teach the guys the first two seconds. I want to see you track. I want to see how far you push back. The next two seconds, I want to see how much you can push your knees out. The other two seconds, I want to see how, how far you can go. So we're still teaching toe straight ahead, chest up, good posture, thumbs locked in, lats locked in. Six, five, four, three, two, one. I told him to hold it, and I'll make sure you get back up. So that has the perfect squat that you do when you're on a team. That start or the perfect squat. always toe straight ahead. So we're, we're, we're teaching them to try to create torque in the hips. But the biggest thing to understand if you're watching this, we always go back to warm up with the body weight or a bar on their back. I want their toes forward. I want them to get, learn how to create that torque. But as soon as we get a load on our back, I want them squatting where, where, where their anatomy tells them to. Everyone's hips are different, but any coach that tries to force their guys like this, you might be grinding the shit out of their hips because we don't know their anatomical structures. They're all different. So, if I look at a guy and he naturally squats at 15 degrees, then freaking let him take 15 degrees. If you don't know what to take, you don't have to it, but for activation purposes, for lengthening purposes, I want them warming up here, and then we get a load on them. What, what, where, where are their structure tells them to squat? Let them freaking squat. A great coaching for that also is telling them to squat inside the knees. Because that would be right here, little, just, just like you said, a little squat right here, but we want to go ahead and open them up. Hips inside the knees. So, yeah. squat inside the knees. And that's the same progression. So when we go into our lunge, I think our lunge is on our, is on Wednesday. Coach Q is the same thing. Thumbs locked together, chest chest is up. And now everybody wants to do a lunge, whether the lunge is forward right here, or straight down. I tell the guys to focus on building that back knee. So it's not like an in in uh, lunge like you're talking about the the cook and that mess. We're just still hip lift. You want about half body length or about full body length, so right here. And my main focus is, we're dropping that back knee and going straight down. This should be a straight line from your shoulder and your knee when you go down. So once we lock it in, same as that thing. So six, five, four, three, two, one, coming down with your fast half knee, and you're coming back up. And when you're coming back up, you're not pushing straight up, but you want to kind of push behind you in that same motion you're down. Right, so real quick, folks, so just squat wise. So our first progression is eccentric, then we'll go to ISO. So we sit at the bottom of the squat, now there's ice and hold. So we want to get them in, we want to perfect that bottom position. So we'll lock them in there now and they just hold it. So that's our, our week one and two is eccentric and six, that's six, 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 yeah, six, 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 yeah, right, so and then we'll, we'll repeat that. And then we go to the time under tension. So now they're at the bottom, we're starting at the bottom, and now we're just working three inches. So we'll sit their ass on a med ball and I'll say up, one, two, down, one. So I want constant, so oscillation, I want constant movement. Just working that bottom piece of the squat, getting them comfortable down low, um, and then the last thing, but uh, and the last thing we'll work at the six and two school of three is almost six. Inch. So now we're just working the whole thing nice, slow, controlled time retention, never locking the knees out. So they're constantly at time retention. Um, yeah, same with our lunges, same with everything. So that's that's the general part. Um, before we cut that, there's more here, Dave. Uh, no, we don't have that. I mean, we're probably. Past an hour, right? Uh, probably getting close. 
Yes. Okay. So, um, Coach, I mean, like you said, you've been writing programs through 1993. Just for all the listeners and young coaches, any uh, book recommendations or just general advice or what you what you learned the most over, and especially you when you're in a result based uh, world. I think so. the best advice I'll just give you it's a it's a, it's two things. Uh, first, never change your program more than 10% a year because you don't know how it turns out. And so our sports are different than football in that you guys have, for the most part, although maybe one or two games won't count because they're the money games or whatever for the most part, your conference games, every game is as equally important as the other. For us, we get paid to throw far at conference regionals and nationals. So most of the year, even though they're meets and they're scored, those are just practice for what I'm going to consider the championship portion of the season. So I have to know how things are going to turn out during the championship portion. And if I change my program more than you know roughly 10%, that's a, a number I was just given, then you don't know how it's going to turn out. And so you know we live in a in an information age, so if you read a new book and you go, oh, that's the way I want to do it this year, and you turn the wheel of your program, I'm, I'm basically stealing this from Judd Logan, you turn the wheel of your program and you, you go in uh, Cal Deeds triphasic training direction, and there's nothing wrong or you know good or bad about that situation, it's just if you go that way, you don't know how it's going to turn out when it counts. And then the next year you read something else and you turn your wheel the op opposite direction and you don't know how it's going to turn out. And so you don't know how to make the small adjustments to move what you did and didn't like because you're always all over the place where if you're just making small corrections. And so what I'm personally doing this year is I'm only changing, and I'll use Matt's term because I really like it, I'm changing the A and I'm changing the Z. I'm pretty good after, this is my 17th year here, I pretty much know what my kids need to do leading up into the major championships. Coming all Americans. Yeah. Uh, 16 individual uh, first teams. So yeah, it's, it's, it's not as much as you'd like, obviously, but we do okay. Um, the, the point is... <laughs> Win a couple, couple championships, but we're doing the, okay. The, the simple point is, is that I have to know how it's going to turn out, and I have to know what I need to do to make adjustments a few weeks out if it looks like it's not going to get to where I want to go. Because it doesn't matter what the numbers are in here. They're, those are all fake with respect to how far you can throw. The only thing that matters is how far the implement goes for us. It doesn't matter if you show up at the national championship meet and you have the biggest bench but you don't win, no one cares. You have the biggest squat, the biggest clean, the biggest vertical jump, it doesn't matter. It's how, that, it's how those things positively affect how far you throw and when you do those things and when you're setting your body up to come out of different training phases and recovery equals how far you throw, or at least the potential to throw far, because at the end of the day, the kid still has to get in there and compete, uh, which is sometimes a problem. Yeah. So I think that the, I would not change things too much. Uh, now, sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate that I've been in one, one place with similar facilities, similar everything. If I have, I know some coaches that have been at 10 schools in the same amount of time I've been here. That's pretty insane. So you're constantly changing support staff and you're constantly changing facilities and you know, so your program's changing globally constantly through no fault of your own because you're just in a completely different environment year after year after year. If you're in the same environment and you wanna have wisdom about your program, then it's making those small changes. The second thing I would say, this is also, I'm stealing this from Judd, uh, but it's, it's great wisdom. A bad program believed in is better than a great program not believed in. You can be the greatest strength coach or throws coach in the entire world, but if your program, if all the kids think you're an idiot, then they're not going to get better. It's just that simple. So you have to sell them on the fact that your program is going to make them better and you have to find a way for them to have many successes along the way, especially if you're someone taking over a program, because um, I think that happens a lot in the football world. You go in, you take over someone's program, and you have a completely different philosophy than somebody else. Well, sometimes you can't use your entire philosophy right away because you have to sell them on the small changes. And so for me, 
I find ways to make them feel successful right away. Even if they're just making small improvements, if they make small improvements, they're gonna be more excited about coming to work every day. If they're not getting better, they're not gonna work hard. It's just that simple. Once an athlete reaches a certain point, they've invested what they think is an appropriate amount of energy, and they're not receiving the results they're desiring, you lost them. And so it's your job to sell them on small successes so then you can implement your entire philosophy. What about uh, books? I mean, I mean obviously, books. Oh, man. Um, what, what have been the most influential books? We don't have to be strange to anything. What's the most influential books? Maybe two or three of them? Um, probably the best book I've written, uh, written recently, written, read, uh, Tools of Titans by Tim Ferriss. It's, it's awesome. Um, he also has Four Hour Body and Four Hour Work Week and Four Hour Chef, but tools those aren't as, uh, as um, important to Tools. I think Tools of Titans is awesome. Um, another book I read recently, which I really liked, was something called Extreme Ownership. Yep. Yep. Uh, you know, written by Navy SEAL Jacko, something or other. I can't remember his name. Um, but I just, the reason I'm here talking and learning is that you should always be searching for that next 10%. So what, whatever I do this year, you know, I wanna search for the next 10% next year. Uh, um, I wanna do body, body tempering, you know? I started figuring some stuff out and he has a certification. I'm gonna figure out, you know, body tempering. Always look for that next 10%, never rest on, oh, I have a really good program, it's awesome. But the more you know, the more small changes you can make to that 10%, one way or the other, to continue your team moving in the right direction. Because wins is all that matters. And if you're not winning, you're not gonna have a job, and you're not gonna have longevity to you know, really get wise. The other thing I would say, and this is the one thing I like that Matt's doing, even though he's 28, 27, 27 <laughs> way younger than me is, you go through a continuum, and if you want to master your subject, you have to teach it. And so, you know, this thing you're doing with the web and interns having staff development day, you know, if you really want to know their subject matter, you have to be able to defend your opinion on things. And so, you know, not only do you not want to stop learning, but you have to find ways to mentor other people um, because that helps you in your continuation as, as a coach, is to be mentor, be a mentor be someone who was mentored and still have mentors and then be mentoring other people. I think, I think so much of the ego too. I mean, it's something that I, I promised myself I wouldn't come into this thing with. And you, you can't grow if you have a giant ego. You know what I mean? It's something I literally feel like I've learned every intern I've ever had. I've probably honestly taken one thing from, but it's because we're so open. Like when, when we program, we do it like this. Like we, we go in my office and we program on the whiteboard but I never program behind shut doors without these guys because you never know what idea he might have as long as he has reasoning for it of how that can make it better. So I, my ego ain't too big to learn from a high school coach, from a middle school. I mean, I don't, I don't care. I just want to learn. All I care about is I know if I'm, if I'm learning, I'm getting better. Um, so I think putting our egos aside is a huge thing that we need to be able to do, uh, which obviously, you know, that's what we're doing today. Um, but appreciate, appreciate you coming. Uh, Obviously, a ton of knowledge bombs today. Um, a lot of really cool stuff from Coach as well. And uh, like I said, if you guys have any questions about any of this, and we have our template. If you guys want to get a look at our, our, uh, our template, just email me. Uh, you can find it on Akron's website, or I can put it in the show notes as well. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed, and uh, we'll see you guys next time.